Okay, let's uh, let's kick off. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are around the world. Uh, we are very delighted to welcome you to this first of the relaunch sessions of the PGC Worldwide Lab Meeting. Um, I'm Professor Catherine Lewis. I'm an executive director of the PGC and co-chair of the MDD Working Group. Uh, and I'm Professor of Statistical Genetics at King's College London. So the Worldwide Lab Meetings are the PGC's regular scientific forum, and they form an online platform to hear about exciting research that's going on both inside and outside the PGC. And if you have ideas of what you'd like to hear about in these sessions, or if you'd like to offer to talk or organize a session, I would really like to hear from you. So please do let me know how you would like this uh, community forum to be run. Uh, these worldwide lab meetings are open to everyone, although they're run by the PTC, we're delighted for you to forward the information to your colleagues and your collaborators, and we're particularly pleased this afternoon or today to uh, welcome members of the International uh, Society of Psychiatric Genetics. So today uh, we have a series of presentations on the genetics of suicide uh, and this working group in the PGC is the latest uh, group to join the PGC um, and so we're delighted that they've taken this opportunity uh, to give us the chance to hear about their work and their plans. Um, before I hand over to Neve Mullins for the very first talk, um, I want to uh, do a bit of housekeeping. So at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A uh, button there. If you have questions uh, for the speakers, please do use the Q&A um, and they will either answer during the session or we can take the questions live at the end. We should have a few minutes of uh, questions uh, just before the hour. Um, and, and you can also ask your question verbally then. Uh, and so for our first talk, I'll hand over to uh, Neve Mullins from the Ikan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Over to you, Neve. Thanks, Catherine. So I'll give a very brief introduction to the session, um, an introduction to the new suicide working group of the PGC, um, a history and our future plans. So um, this group has been operating as the International Suicide Genetics Consortium over the last several years. Um, we established this consortium in 2018 with the aim of accelerating genetic discoveries for suicide phenotypes through worldwide collaboration. And there was a real need for a consortium based approach to these studies. And we decided to focus initially on doing a large GWAS of suicide attempt. And um, we had tremendous enthusiasm from um, members of the scientific community to participate in this study um, and our first uh, GWAS included 18 cohorts all of which are shown in this figure uh, we really had worldwide representation and um, we worked by having GWAS conducted at each site and summary stats shared with the ISGC uh, we developed standardized case and control definitions, standardized analysis protocols to ensure comparability and rigor across the sites. And we were able to conduct a multi ancestry meta analysis of suicide attempt within a couple of years. So we published this paper last year in Biological Psychiatry. Um, we did a GWAS of almost 30,000 cases of suicide attempt versus over half a million controls from 18 cohorts. We found two genome-wide significant loci, one in the MHC and one in an intragenic region on chromosome seven. We were then able to condition the GWAS of suicide attempt on genetics of MDD using MT Kojo, and we demonstrated an independent genetic liability to suicide attempt after conditioning on MDD. That chromosome seven intragenic locus also remained genome-wide significant after conditioning. And um, so, what I'm showing in the far plot here is that this locus has its strongest effect on suicide attempt. It's not been associated with any psychiatric disorder previously, uh, but it is also a genome-wide significant hit for risk-taking behavior, smoking, and insomnia. And we were also able to replicate this locus in an independent cohort of over 14,000 suicide attempt cases from Million Veteran Program, and making this the first genome-wide significant locus for suicide attempt to actually replicate. Peace. 
Elsewhere in the paper, we demonstrated positive genetic correlations between suicide attempt and all psychiatric disorders, particularly MDD, um, as well as with many non-psychiatric and medical risk factors. And our summary stats from this study are available online. You can find the link in the paper. Uh, we have a short application form where we collect some information about investigators and how the data will be used um, and provide some guidelines given the highly sensitive nature of this topic and um, but we have approved all of the um, applications to date. Of course, this is the work of very many people worldwide, over 250 co-authors, and I want to acknowledge everybody who really came together to make this work possible. Since the ISGC-1 paper, we have been working on a newer meta-analysis between ISGC and Million Veteran Programme, and that will be covered in the first presentation today. So recently, the ISGC became the suicide working group of the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, and our goals remain the same, to uncover the genetic and biological etiology of suicide attempts, suicide death, and suicidal ideation. And the working group is co-chaired by Anna Doherty, Doug Rudifer, and myself. And this is an overview of some of the data we have within the working group. So we have been compiling a list of cohorts for our upcoming GWAS, and these are our projected minimum numbers of cases within five years for suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, and suicide. These are from 39 cohorts, 21 are new since ISGC1, and our outreach is ongoing now through the PGC. And we're also developing a catalogue of biospecimen sequence data and omics data, which are available for many of these cohorts and will allow us to do targeted follow-up of findings from the study. Briefly, these are some of the analyses that we have planned in the near future. So we'll be doing multi-ancestry GWAS of each of these suicide outcomes, dissecting their genetic etiology from that of psychiatric disorders, examining the shared and distinct genetic etiologies between the three suicide outcomes, looking for causal risk factors, and the relevant cell types, pathways, drug targets, by mapping of GWAS loci, uh, we'll be able to examine ancestry and sex differences and develop genetic risk predictors that can be combined with uh, clinical risk predictors. So if you're interested in becoming involved in the new uh, PGC suicide working group, as I said, we are seeking additional cohorts for our forthcoming studies. Um, these would comprise cases of suicidal ideation, attempt or suicide. Uh, we have data from a range of different phenotyping methods. And as I said, we develop standardized uh, phenotyping guidelines. We can work with colleagues to um, help with phenotype definitions in various cohorts. The cases can have any or no psychiatric disorder that's not a requirement for inclusion and to date we've worked by sharing GWAS some stats but now through the PGC we'll also have the capacity to intake individual level data and uh, we are interested in including data of any ancestry group uh, we have strongly encouraged diversity um, within the working group from the outset and so we have monthly calls on the third Wednesday of the month. We alternate between an early and a late slot to accommodate different time zones. Um, we have just established our PGC suicide working group mailing list, and we'll have a symposium and an open uh, working group meeting at WCPG this year where you can meet us in person. Um, these are the emails for the co-chairs. If you're interested in becoming involved, um, please do reach out to us and we will soon have our information up on the PGC website as well. So that's a very brief introduction and overview from me. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A, but for now I will hand over to Anna for the first uh, science presentation. Thank you, Neve. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to uh, deliver some of the highlights of the multi-ancestry GWAS meta-analysis that Neve has just described. Um, this is a really uh, uh, fun collaboration with MVP, um, the uh, International uh, Suicide Genetics Consortium and MVP have been working together now for a couple of years 
um, and, uh, and have really produced a lot of interesting work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, this is also uh, supported by um, folks at Duke and Vanderbilt, Mount Sinai, Huntsman. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to report. I do get current funding from NIH and some foundation funding. Um, and so I, uh, Neve spoke to the um, sort of the genetic relevance of suicide as a phenotype. And I, I just want to give a little bit of broader context um, to this phenotype. So this is something that spans all of healthcare and psychiatry. It's, um, it's really relevant to virtually every psychiatric disorder. It's also preventable. So we know that research in, on suicide is um, likely going to have a, a high public health impact. Um, we know that it's heritable, that suicide runs in families, and that um, polygenic risk for suicide death is associated with earlier uh, age at death. Um, and suicide also reflects behavioral phenotypes. So suicide attempt and suicide death are behaviors that um, are, are nice in the sense that they, um, they bypass some of the psychometric issues that we see with, with disorders um, based on our, um, our diagnostic systems. So um, so doing a GWAS of suicide death and suicide attempt to, to me is just a really interesting, as a clinician, a really interesting um, venture. So Neve has told you a little bit about the, the first um, ISGC GWAS meta-analysis of suicide attempt. Um, I just want to um, reiterate the two genome-wide significant loci on chromosomes six and seven. Um, and this locus on chromosome seven, this um, strong signal remains significant after accounting for major depressive disorder and other psychiatric disorders. And this signal was actually also replicated in MVP. Um, and that was pretty exciting to us. It was the first replication of a genetic signal across an with an independent cohort. ISGC uh, reflects 18 cohorts. This initial meta-analysis reflected 18 cohorts with three ancestry groups. Um, and the case phenotype here was defined by life, lifetime uh, suicide attempt via psychiatric interview or self-report or EHR, electronic health records. And then about 13% of the samples in this meta-analysis were suicide deaths via coroner's reports. Um, so 12 of the cohorts were ascertained for psychiatric disorders, um, with, and we uh, had a lot of data contributed from different working groups in the PGC for this. And, uh, and overall, the controls came from the general population, were screened for suicide attempt if possible, and um, generally weren't screened for psychiatric disorders. Um, I won't go into the sort of different microarrays used, um, but generally the, the GWAS conducted were within ancestry in Plink2, and they were fixed effects models. So that's, that's the meta-analysis one. And meta-analysis two, uh, by the Million Veteran Program, looked at four uh, ancestry cohorts uh, comprising about 14,000 cases altogether of suicide attempt. Um, they uh, identified two genome-wide significant loci on chromosomes 20 and 1, and a really strong signal on the DRD2 locus was replicated in ISGC. So there was a sort of a, a signal um, that was replicated across both, and we thought, boy, maybe, um, maybe combining these two GWAS meta-analyses will, will provide more insight. So these cohorts were quite different. So these are US military veterans, uh, different ascertainment. This is a biobank study, um, and uh, non-fatal suicide attempt was assessed by mental health surveys, ICD codes, and a suicide prevention application network database. Um, again, GWAS were conducted within Ancestry in, in Plink2. Um, and, uh, and you'll see here that the, the genetic correlation between the ISGC and MVP summary stats um, resulted in, an, it was an estimate of 0.86, uh, so quite high despite these you know, pretty considerable ascertainment differences. We have this international sample of uh, cohorts from the general population and psychiatric outpatients, and then you have these uh, US military veterans. Um, so that was quite promising. And this big multi-ancestry GWAS meta-analysis then uh, was conducted on all 22 cohorts. I'm showing you here a breakdown uh, by ancestry of all of the cohorts involved. We had a, a fair number of um, Asian ancestries in, in uh, 
the cohorts in African American ancestries, we, we were not able to um, do any ancestry specific meta analyses of Latin American ancestries, um, because we only had the one cohort, but all of these uh, cohorts were involved in the, the large multi ancestry meta analysis. Um, and what we've done so far are again multi ancestry analyses and then ancestry specific meta analyses in European uh, African and Asian ancestries using fixed effects models um, in metal and uh, deriving uh, SNP heritability on the uh, liability scale for um, those we had adequate power um, to estimate for. And then um, we also conducted enrichment analyses and integrated GWAS results with gene pathway and tissue databases. Um, we looked at overlap with the GWAS catalog and population-based research. And, uh, and ran drug target enrichment analyses, summary data-based Mendelian randomization analyses using metabrain data, um, estimates of genetic correlations with uh, lots of psychiatric and medical phenotypes using LD score regression. And then we were able to condition um, a suicide attempt on uh, major depression and PTSD using MT Kojo. And uh, PTSD was included here because it seemed pretty relevant to the veteran population um, in MVP. And finally, we also conducted latent causal variable genetic analyses to try to detect any evidence of um, genetic uh, causal direction uh, using CTGVL. So here is the, the primary Manhattan plot for the multi-ancestry GWAS. And, um, and we estimated heritability at 5.7%, you'll see a lot of genes were implicated here. And again, that really strong peak at chromosome seven. Um, and this is assuming that this liability uh, scale heritability estimate is assuming a prevalence of 2% of suicide attempt in the general population. And these are the, uh, the significant uh, loci detected in the multi-ancestry analysis and the European ancestry analysis. So there were eight genome-wide significant loci detected in the multi-ancestry analysis. These are the genes um, that they map to. And then uh, four unique loci were detected in the European-only uh, meta-analysis. And I also want to point out that there were about 23 multi-ancestry genome-wide significant genes um, evident from the gene-based tests in MAGMA and 14 genome-wide significant genes in the European-only meta-analysis. So quite fruitful results so far. And, um, and when we ran the ancestry-specific analyses in African and uh, Asian uh, ancestry cohorts, we did not find any genome-wide significant variants. I'm showing you here the top variants, um, and this was for the African and African-American ancestry cohorts. Um, but we did find two genome-wide significant genes in the gene-based tests, one of which um, is associated with synaptic plasticity and a member of the Norexin family. So, um, and, and this is probably, um, probably going to change as we accumulate more uh, diverse ancestry cohorts, and we are working really hard on this. Um, so uh, overall, we saw significant uh, tissue expression um, in brain with these multi-ancestry and European ancestry analyses using MAGMA. And, um, and we found this um, pretty amazing overlap with GWAS catalog um, results. Uh, there were 93 phenotypes with significant SNP overlap in the GWAS catalog. I'm showing you here the top results. And locus zoom plots on the right here corresponding to the signals in the multi ancestry GWAS. Um, the top results all corresponded to uh, one of three chromosomes chromosome 7, chromosome 11, and chromosome 15. You'll see on 7, those GWAS are associated with risk tolerance, um, maybe risk taking, and smoking. Uh, chromosome 11 associated with depression, neuroticism, depressive symptoms, and then, uh, and then chromosome 15 is for more uh, health factors uh, like bl blood pressure and coronary artery disease. Um, so, uh, so we wanted to look at the genetic correlations of suicide attempt via this meta-analysis with um, phenotypes that are highly comorbid with suicide risk. And you'll see here, um, there are a, a number of really significant genetic correlations 
The only one uh, that is not significant here is the control PRS for body mass index. Um, and you'll see really high correlations with major depression, with self-harm behaviors and uh, uh, self-harm ideation. Um, when we were able to condition the uh, GWAS meta-analysis summary statistics on major depression and PTSD, we found that um, some, of the, some of the genetic correlations were actually elevated and um, remained significant uh, after conditioning. And these related, again, to smoking, risk tolerance, uh, ADHD, interestingly. Um, and, uh, and so it's sort of food for thought um, clinically when you account for depression, seeing these sort of spikes or increases in, in maybe signal for, for smoking, pulmonary health, and uh, disinhibition or impulsivity. So then we, um, we ran latent causal variable analyses to try to understand whether there was any uh, evidence of direction or causation of these genetic correlations. Um, and so uh, what you see here are um, suicide attempt estimates of genetic causal proportion. Um, these are the top findings for the suicide attempt GWAS. I have in red here at the top, um, those relating to, to lung health or, or pulmonary health, which seem to be strong signals. And these are FDR corrected uh, p-values. And, and there is pretty significant evidence for uh, genetic causal um, association with suicide attempt. When we break it down um, into suicide attempt versus suicide death, we see very strong signals for smoking related variables, breathing related variables in suicide death. Uh, mostly accounted for by males, um, although our samples of females in the suicide death cohorts are quite small. Um, so it's, it, I'm guessing it's probably a, a, an artifact of a lack of power in females, but um, this was, again, quite interesting and kind of indicated that uh, smoking and breathing related problems may be associated with suicide. And, um, and last, the chromosome 15 uh, finding was of interest um, in part because of the summary data-based Mendelian randomization analyses that, um, that Neve Mullins conducted. And this is a plot showing um, evidence of uh, increase in uh, suicide attempt risk via alteration of gene expression levels of FES and TIAF1 in cortex, so an increase in expression of FES, a decrease in expression of TIAF1, and FES is specifically mapped on, on that 15 signal that we saw in the GWAS. And with that, I will, um, I will wrap up. Uh, Neve has gone through some of our future directions already, but I'd really like to thank the, um, the suicide working group in general and a uh, Few people are listed here, but a number of people have been involved in the analyses and write-up of this analysis. Um, and, uh, and the Million Veteran Program, uh, the, these folks have been just an absolute delight to work with, and um, we've really enjoyed our collaboration. And the PGC working groups who have contributed data and have um, provided some pretty novel insights into our analyses of suicide risk. And thank you. And with that, I think I will um, pass the uh, baton over to Allison. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present our work on a GWAS of suicidal ideation in the Million Veteran Program. I have no disclosures. And suicide behaviors just in general are, you know, a really important focus for the Veterans Administration. We know now that suicide is the second leading cause of death for Afghanistan, Iraq era 
veterans. And if you look in this slide, or I'm sorry, graph, which is shown here, you can see that veterans in particular are disproportionately affected by suicidal behaviors. So while veterans only account for about eight and a half percent of the U.S. population, they actually account for nearly 20 percent of suicide deaths. Suicidal ideation is also a concern for veterans. So if you ask our veterans, nearly 10% of them will, oops, sorry, um, endorse having had suicidal ideation in the preceding year. And you compare that with 5% in the US population. The reason ideation in particular is important is because it often precedes and predicts attempts and deaths. So it offers a real opportunity for prevention. So despite this, the underlying architecture of suicidal ideation really is not well known at this point. There is evidence that it is heritable. And there's also evidence in the literature that it has both shared and unique genetic components to other suicide behaviors, such as attempts and death. The largest GWAS published so far, which has included ideation as one of those phenotypes, was recently uh, presented by the UK Biobank. And what they did was an analysis, which was actually an ordinal analysis, looking at suicidality, where ideation was you know, one of those behaviors, deliberate self-harm, and then attempts. And from that analysis, they identified three genome-wide significant loci. And interestingly, when they controlled for other psychiatric disorders, that did not attenuate those three loci. Um, they also had restricted that analysis to individuals of European ancestry, since that was really the bulk of the UK Biobank data set. So given that we knew suicidal ideation is much more common in veterans, and we have this multi-ethnic representation within the MVP, we proceeded to conduct our own GWAS of suicidal ideation. For those of you not familiar with the MVP, really the goal of that study is to understand the interplay between genes, lifestyle, and military exposures on human health. You know, as the name of the program might imply, you know, the goal is to enroll a million veterans. So we thus far have gotten close to that goal, but we're still enrolling. Study participants self-select to participate, and their participation involves giving a blood sample, completing a variety of questionnaires, and then allowing us to link those data to the VA electronic health record, which is a beautiful health record system. For us in our study specifically, you know, as Anna sort of already introduced, we divide defined our suicide phenotypes from a variety of different methods, including ICD codes, these mental health surveys, and then these two databases, the SPAN and the National Death Index. Because we were particularly interested in focusing on ideation for this specific analysis, 
We excluded folks who had a known history of attempt or death or had some indeterminate behavior or death. The genotyping was conducted on this custom axiom array, and there was a centralized group who performed the data cleaning and the imputation. The ancestral groups were previously defined by this um, process called HAIR, um, and I gave you the reference there, which basically combined sort of self-report and genetic markers. So if you look in this graphic here, you will see the relative distribution of the ancestries. So, you know, it is more diverse than a lot of other biobanks, although still by far and large, individuals of European ancestry are the largest contributors. Importantly, what we noticed was the frequency of suicidal ideation differed significantly um, by ancestry. We had also seen this in our previous work for suicide attempt, but whereas with suicide attempt, it was much more common in individuals of African ancestry. For ideation, it was actually more common among Hispanics. Cases were also much more likely to be female and younger. So based on the fact that we knew there was this significant difference in the frequency of ideation across the ancestry, what we did was analyze the ancestral groups separately, controlling for genetic substructure within each, and then we ultimately perform meta-analysis to combine the different ancestries. So I provided the lambdas here. What you can see is for the European ancestry, there was a bit of inflation. When we looked at LD score regression, that intercept was 1.04, which was suggesting that this inflation really was probably due to you know, multiple genes being involved, polygenic architecture, rather than population structure per se. Um, you know, once we performed our analyses and we had genome-wide significant hits, we reached out to our colleagues, some of which you have just heard from in the IG, ISGC, to perform replication. We also used LD score regression to estimate heritability and to look at the overlap of the genetic correlation between ideation and attempt within the MVP. Downstream analysis was performed with FUMA. So here are the results from our meta-analysis. We detected five genome-wide significant loci. Two of those nominally replicated in the ISGC. One was EXD3 here on chromosome nine, and the other was ESR1 on chromosome six. So EXD3 is a exonuclease and this gene has actually been previously associated with PTSD in the MVP. And in fact, you know, one of the strongest comorbidities of suicidal ideation within the MVP is PTSD. So ESR1 is the estrogen receptor. And that gene was actually also 
previously uh, reported in the MVP associated with anxiety. And actually the lead SNP in this gene was the same SNP in both those um, analyses. So um, the other important thing to mention is really across these loci, there really was only one locus which gave any sort of eminence for heterogeneity across the different ancestral groups. In terms of the ancestry specific analyses, there was only one ancestry specific analysis that resulted in genome wide significant loci. Not surprisingly, that was the European American subset because it was the largest, most powerful subset within the MVP. You previously saw the association with EXD3 on chromosome nine. And then we also picked up this other signal on chromosome six. And so both of these loci also replicated in ISGC1, which was also primarily, although not exclusively, European American ancestry. In terms of the heritability estimate on the observed scale, the heritability of ideation was estimated to be about 2%. When it was on the liability scale, it was about 1%. And perhaps most interesting, the genetic correlation within the MVP between ideation and attempts was 0.77 which was slightly less than what we observed of the genetic correlation of attempts between the MVP and ISGC1. So, you know, this sort of confirms some of these previous studies which have shown that ideation genetically overlaps some of these other uh, suicide phenotypes, but does also appear to have some independent signal. When we look at the genes implicated from the meta-analysis, we found genes enriched in a variety of different things, including body fat distribution, but perhaps most notably bipolar disorder. And then the meta-analysis genes were also enriched for expression in brain. So in summary, you know, we have compared or sort of generated the largest GWAS of ideation today. We identified six genome-wide significant loci. Five of those were actually implicated across multiple ancestries. And as I just sort of stated, the genetic risk for ideation, at least in veterans, largely overlaps that with the genetic risk of attempts, both in veterans and civilians, but yet still has somewhat of a unique component. Having said that, you know, most of the loci I just described really have been previously implicated in other psychiatric conditions. So while they were not novel and unique to ideation, the fact that they were previously associated with these other psychiatric phenotypes that are often comorbid with ideation um, and the fact that ISGC was able to replicate them do provide some confidence in the findings. You know, with all studies, there are limitations. And I think for us, some of the more important limitations were, you know, we didn't have an ideation only data set for replication. You know, as previously described, ISGC1 really was attempts which was inclusive of ideation. Um, and the other important thing is 
we still need to increase the representation from diverse ancestral groups. Um, and to that end, the MVP is still continuing ascertainment. And ISGC is also expanding, particularly trying to focus on diverse ancestral groups. And then finally, this is just one more example of, you know, the wonderful partnership that the MVP has established with ISGC. And we hope, you know, we'll just continue that productivity in the future. So I'm going to stop there and acknowledge my co-authors here. And now I am going to turn the baton over to Dr. Rudifer, who is uh, going to do the next presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Allison, and Eve, Catherine. This has been wonderful. I'm going to change gears uh, somewhat, kind of will end at the beginning, if you will, and talk more about phenotyping, specifically phenotyping extraction definitions in the context of leaving electronic health records for suicide ideation. The work I'm going to present has, has been driven by a really talented MD PhD student in the lab who just graduated her PhD, uh, Jay Kang. And kind of to echo some comments that Allison made, I'm not going to talk about this mostly today, but from a healthcare perspective, the earliest time point in which you can identify an individual who is actively, uh, you know, kind of stating that they are thinking about self-harm is the best possible chance and opportunity to intervene. So, so just defining this as a phenotype could be really important from a clinical perspective. But what we're mostly talking about today is thinking about phenotype in the context of understanding genetic architecture. And I point to this one study, there's, some, there's other ones, there's a most recent one on Alzheimer's actually, which is kind of interesting, looking at uh, the phenotypic definition and the underlying genetic architecture of depression. Looking at UK Biobank, what they did was define multiple different sources, multiple different extraction methods for defining depression. And they looked at heritability here as displayed here. And if you compare codes to kind of self-reports to even help seeking behavior, compared to defining specific cardinal symptoms related to the clinical diagnostic criteria of the disease, you can see pretty dramatic um, differences in heritability, which can actually create a lot of differences in what we might see from genetic architecture. And why this is really important from the electronic health record perspective, we're actually starting with a, you know, a sense of riches. And we can extract from lots of different sources, lots of different information, lots of different types of sources, different phenotypes, and, and kind of three broad categories that we tend to use are what we call structured data, which is the easiest ones. Those are the most portable, most standardized. Those are codes, typically billing codes, but can include procedural codes or lab results. Semi-structured, which are more kind of like surveys or forms or reports or screening tools. And then unstructured, which is kind of where we tend to think there might be a lot more information. It's just a lot harder to extract. These are going to be any narrative text, so clinical notes or messages. And we can kind of go through for suicidation and think of each of these categories, how we might extract them, and what does that mean in terms of our ultimate phenotype at the end of the day. So we know from prior work that even when a patient has documentation of suicidation, even when it's in the notes, very rarely is it actually coded. And there's a lot of reasons why this is the case. But it does point to the fact that if we use codes, which are, again, simple, easy, portable, standardized, it's still going to likely lead to an underreporting of suicidation broadly. And this number is particularly low in this population, but it is generally going to tell us that codes are helpful and valuable and we should use them, but probably not going to capture the whole population that we would like. They're also, they change over time. And, and this plot shows kind of, you know, between 2015, 2017, as a healthcare system, BMC all went from IC9, phased out to IC10. And what this is showing is kind of the proportion of individuals in a given year that are actually have one of these codes. And this is going up over time. And you know, we haven't looked carefully at this, at whether that's just we're doing better at coding or whether that's actually increased in prevalence. But our expectations typically for incident uh, suicidation in a given year is maybe tenfold higher than what we're seeing in a given year in our healthcare system. Again, pointing to the fact that codes uh, change, not only do they change over time, but they actually are still underreported. And most interestingly, if you take a number of individuals that have one of these codes and you take so there's a single code for suicidation in ICD-9, there's a single code for a suicidation in ICD-10, and you look at precision or positive predictive value, which is based on the proportion of individuals with that code that actually from chart review have that uh, phenotype, it's changed pretty dramatically, at least in our hands, from about 60% of those patients in ICD-9 
about 85% with Odyssey 10. So even the codes themselves, as they change, as they create, you know, kind of new um, coding schemes could also differ in terms of the precision and performance of that phenotype generally. We can then move to uh, kind of the more, we, specifically the suicide screening forms in our, in our case, which is kind of semi-structured. And the semi-structured data is usually really good. It's usually high precision. No one's you know, it's an expert asking a patient specifically about particular questions, but they can be challenging to find within the EHR. They can be buried in particular areas of that uh, resource. They're often unique to any given healthcare system, and they're typically applied to a very specific population. In our case, the suicide screening is predominantly done in the emergency, in the psychiatric emergency room. And that leads to a very interesting ascertainment uh, process for who do we have these forms are, if we're using them to decide if someone says yes to suicidation, if using that for our case population, what does that case population represent compared to the general population or even the hospital-wide population? And just to give a little context of what that looks like in our, in our data, we have about 5,000 people that have admitted that have kind of said yes to a suicidation screening compared to about 20,000 that have an ICD-10 code. And you look at the demographics, you see in general, this population is going to be a little bit older, more likely to be white, more likely to be female, less likely to be um, Hispanic. So there's a different population, different ascertainment comprising here that matters in terms of each phenotyping method may result in somewhat different ascertainment criteria, somewhat different demographic features, which is important for the way we think about kind of phenotyping and genetics. Moving to, to what might be the most interesting, but also the most complex and challenging, this idea of unstructured data. This is everything that somebody sends in a message, you know, in a note to a patient or messages, uh, just kind of narrative text about the medical process for a given patient. And this often requires the use of natural language processing and provides kind of, you know, the maximum amount of information we might have. Of course, extracting it is really difficult. I don't have time to go into really detail about the methodological approach that we've taken, which was developed and led by our great colleague, Adi Bayon here. But I point to this kind of preprint, which is, which is nice and, and lovely and, and gives it a sense of what, what we can do with some you know, sophisticated NLP tools and show just a little bit about the performance here and, and actually performance of identifying that true cases of association is quite good. And of course, combining, we'll get to talk about a little bit, but combining different methods is actually that can make things even better. So we have a pretty good approach to use NLP to capture suicide ideation. But even thinking about that, um, and we think about how many patients we may extract, and, and the 187,000 number here is a big number of patients. This is any, any individual that has any mention or anything in any of their notes about suicide But the vast majority of those, and, and really at least half of them have only negative mentions. And we talk about negation in NLP a lot, because what happens is typical screening is done is, you know, you ask a, a patient, have they ever had thoughts of harm themselves? And they'll say no more often than not. And that's, you know, you'll say denied suicidation or no, you know, no evidence of suicidation. There's a million ways to say kind of no, which is negation, which is sometimes hard to pull out contextually, but we can do that pretty well. And again, most of the time, these are screens and the patients say no. If you look at this number of 187,000, even knowing that most of those are not high quality suicidation cases, it still represents 6% of our population, right? If we think of lifetime risk as quoted in the literature of 9% for suicidation or even close to that, we're not even there with every possible mention in every possible patient and every possible note in the entire healthcare system. So there's no way to think of that in the context of it's still under And you can imagine a million ways why this would be the case, but the amount of people we might expect with suicidation in our healthcare system does not represent it in the process of healthcare that we can capture from EHR. It's one of the big takeaways here. So we can do a, a pretty good job of assigning precision and a given patient falls in a sense of how likely is this person a true case? And this is the plot here showing again, most individuals are very low precision because they're more likely to be negations, more likely to die suicidation. And if we define a precision of suicide ideation cases about 80%, which we think is relatively reasonable, that's about 1% of all those mentions. It reduces our population really, really dramatically. So I think that's, you know, kind of gives a context of, of what may exist in the system in general and how we might be able to capture those and where that leads us in terms of identifying cases. The, you know, we can tend to take the, the beautiful work that Allison presented, we can take the MVP suicidation, you know, European GWAS, and we can apply project risk scores to our population, we can align that with the precision that we've calculated purely from the NLP, and we can show that as you get higher and higher precision, as the NLP, as the notes say more and more likely of positive evidence of suicidation, you get increased genetic risk related to suicidation based on an independent analysis of suicidation from MVP. 
And we chose 80% based on just a numerical value, but you actually see it works relatively well for getting what we can imagine as a you know, higher end, higher proportion of individuals um, with kind of underlying genetic risk for association. Something that you'll note in the, this dashed line represents kind of what we, you know, the, the mean polygenic risk score for everybody with no mentions that were always slightly higher, probably not significantly, although we haven't tested it, but there is definitely a mix of patients that probably have underlying genetic risk. And, and what's interesting here is even the, you know, particularly for screeners, even the idea that you're talking about it may increase your risk. There's some else, some, something else medically happening that you're being asked about it overall. Although screening for these types of conditions for suicidality has actually gotten better and more common. So this hopefully changes over time. We can, we can then say, okay, we have, we have the codes, we have the notes, we have the screeners, we have some chart review that we did, we can combine it all in. If we wanted to go maximum sample size, we would put it all together and that would kind of create our largest possible sample of suicide cases. Still less than we would expect in a population, but it gives us our maximum power and that's some of the work that we've done. Um, our sample size here is still a few thousand, so we're not gonna talk much about kind of our genetic results here, but just to give a context of where we would end up with the idea of phenotyping broadly or minimally or, or you know, kind of most screening for, for suicidal patient overall. And we still see that even because it's the simplest, uh, it's still more common to get code than the, any of the other methods. So this is something that I think is interesting that, that we're still kind of thinking through what, what that means for extraction of phenotypes related to suicidation. And then finally, across all of these different methods, we can do a similar analysis, again, using the MVP suicidation PRS, and we can show that this differs as we might expect from prior work, uh, including the one that I presented earlier, that um, tools like direct chart review and uh, screeners that are more direct and explicit provide higher genetic risk for individuals with suicidation than any other approach related to codes or even NLP, even though we can, mac we can kind of tune our you know, genetic risk really based on precision for NLP, which is nice, but still provides us at a level that you know, the direct assessment matters um, and it's gonna to contribute to more risk. And, and what that means in terms of individuals' uh, you know, personal healthcare and why they're getting that assessment is, is really interesting and relevant for this case. I will point out here, and I think this is true, Alison, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, uh, because of the way the VA does suicidality screening, there's a lot more of this kind of general screening across the VA and I think the MVP cases are mostly or predominantly from that type of uh, screening process. So it is a high quality set um, of uh, phenotypic definitions to begin with that we're using to compare the underlying genetics, which of course matters. So with that, basically just you know, kind of pointing out a few big, uh, big items to summarize here is that suicidation is undercoded. You're not, you know, patients that um, may be discussing it or maybe coded for don't get that billing code. It's under documented. There's reasons why it may never come up, why doctors don't want to ask, why the patients don't want to admit to it. Um, so we think that the population that we could find, the broad population we find is not going to be as large as the population that probably exists for lots of those reasons. We think we're biased towards severity. We have a pretty large portion, about a third or more of our SI cases actually have evidence for SA, for suicide attempt, which is much higher than we would expect. Again, who are the patients that are getting screened, that are getting asked, that are admitting um, to having suicidal thoughts? Um, you know, expansive screening can definitely improve this, but that's a that's a healthcare system kind of issue, a procedural issue, which, which I think the VA does a much better job at. Um, there's lots of sources for EHRs that have different, you know, different complexities, different ease, different portabilities, different standardizes, but we can make a big difference in terms of genetic architecture by tuning how precise we want our phenotypes to be. And of course, you know, as always, the caveat, EHR data represents what we call the process of healthcare, not the clinical outcomes. And you're always about one step removed from where you would like to be. Doesn't mean it's not valuable, but keeping that in mind kind of keeps every, you know, keeps you a little more honest about what you're actually looking at and what you're doing. With that, I will just thank uh, everybody in the lab, uh, particularly Jay, who led this work, and Adi, who built the NLP tools, uh, wonderful colleagues at MVP with Allison, Nate, and Jeannie, of course, all the ISGC and now PGC suicide group, and Catherine for, for organizing this. And then I will end, and hopefully there's time for questions. Great, thank you very much uh, to Doug and to all our speakers, and, uh, and I just, uh, I want to note as, as we you know, consider this really you know, difficult uh, phenotype of suicide, I really like your point, Doug, that this is about intervention. This is about being able to, um, you know, to intervene and prevent suicide. And I like that very clinical point you made to start off your talk. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that.
Um, so we now have a few minutes for questions at the end of this webinar. You can either raise your hand on the screen and uh, Grace will then give you permission uh, to, or access to talk, or you can just put a queue into the uh, Q&A uh, tool uh, telling us that you'd like to ask a question. So the floor uh, is now open. Maybe I'll, I'll just kick off with, with one. I mean, I think one of the challenges across psychiatric disorders is heterogeneity. And that's, you know, that's come up in all the talks. You know, how much of an issue is that going to be across your suicide phenotypes? And, and what approaches have you got for dealing with that? You know, who wants to take that first? Probably Neve should take that, yeah. you know, based mm. on uh, her paper. Oh, right. <laughs> Sure, that's a great question, Catherine. Um, so um, we developed standardized phenotyping protocols um, that we distributed across the sites um, in order to tackle that. So um, while our information on suicide attempt phenotype was from a variety of different sources, um, structured psychiatric interviews um, for the majority of cohorts, some self-reports, some ICD codes, and um, we um, take a lot of care to make sure that there is evidence of suicidal intent present, which is um, an important part of this phenotype. So we're not looking at non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, for example. Um, and we work with collaborators on a case-by-case -case basis to look at phenotype definitions in their cohorts as needed. Um, and to, since we are now expanding to look at suicidal ideation, uh, we're developing our phenotyping protocols for ideation as well, and we'll be doing the same um, there. Um, we also look at genetic correlations across the different cohorts um, as possible, depending on the size of each cohort. Um, we will be using polygenic risk scoring um, if, if genetic correlation is not possible um, to assess the um, shared genetic etiology between different cohorts um, and to um, compare the um, homogeneity across different cohorts. Um, so far, we have not seen um, evidence of substantial heterogeneity across cohorts, um, certainly for our genome-wide significant loci, um, and looking at heterogeneity statistics like Q um, statistic and I squared, um, we have not seen evidence of heterogeneity across the cohorts for the genome-wide significant loci, which was um, very encouraging. Mm. Great, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like you've got a good handle on that. Is there anything, Doug, Alison, Anna, anything you want to add there? Um, not with respect to that, but um, I know there was a question from Maria about mm -hmm. imputation in the MVP and whether it would be expanded to larger reference panels. And actually, yes, the, the answer to that is yes. The MVP has been working with the top med uh, consortium to do imputation that way. So, so we're hopeful in the future, you know, this is really particularly important um, for the diversity, which is represented in MVP because top med also has quite a bit of diversity represented. So yes, thank you. Great, thank you. I can't see any hands raised on my screen and there are no, um, ah, Klaus, want to ask a question. Hey, Doug, I had a question. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. we can hear you. This is Klaus Berger from University of Münster in Germany. Um, Doug, given your results, what would you consider to be the GOAT standard of suicidal ideation assessment if we plan a new study and would have all resources that the world offers? So what is the GOAT standard? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question because, I mean, there's, there's gold sand in terms of precision, right? And there's gold sand in terms of, you know, what's, what is the goal, right? So if the goal is to kind of, this is kind of where we get this, this concept of phenotyping in the context of genetics versus phenotyping in the context of almost intervention. And those two things aren't necessarily the same. 
I think it, it, from, from what we've looked at, obviously having someone review charts is really helpful. Directly asking an individual about a particular outcome, like you know, suicidation or suicidal thoughts, is quite good. Although there's plenty of data showing that that answer will change depending on you know context, location, time. Um, so I think it's it's somewhat it's somewhat challenging in the context of what's feasible and what the ultimate goals are. But but those are probably you know the more high precision, the more likely you are to get the true answer is, is kind of the way to go. And that could work. And, and what's interesting, I think there's some data on this that I don't I should know better. Uh, you know, there's probably a difference between whether a provider or whether a medical person asks question versus whether, you know, you get it on an online survey too. So there's, there's context and even the same question in different, by different people in different places may result in, in kind of differing levels of, of precision and accuracy. It's a hard question, Klaus. I think it's the right one. It's what we should be thinking about, but I think it's a it's a hard one. It probably depends on what what your ultimate goal is, because you know, in, in thinking about identifying risk, say you're thinking about from a clinical perspective, identifying risk of individuals for suicidality or suicide attempt, you probably have multiple levels where maybe you'd identify some risk that could be you know more feasible, more automated, but then you'd have to have some direct screening before you would probably do any intervention. And I think that's kind of where where this becomes tricky. Is if your goal is for genetics, then you know, a lot of these survey instruments could be quite good or screening screeners can be quite good if you're looking for intervention then that bar gets raised much higher. Thank you and that's probably a, a useful note to, to finish on. Uh, so I will just end by thanking all our speakers for uh, their great talks, the great introduction to this uh, new worldwide lab series. And thank you also to Grace, who's done all the work behind the scenes to make sure that this works so well. Um, as a final reminder, please email any of the panelists if you have studies uh, with information on any of the suicide phenotypes we've discussed today uh, and you'd like to join the PGC uh, working group. Uh, the video will be up on the PGC uh, YouTube channel shortly, and we look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.